they must communicate and this has become a new logic for product form. The conventional logic was okay you look at function you look at uh, uh, you know material processes this that and create a form which uh, somehow designer gives out of some mysterious things and gives it to you saying this is what you really have. Uh, in the recent past things have changed and started looking at what is a new logic for form. Uh, it started with uh, a new area called product semantics which uh, the first paper on this came in 1984 okay. So it is about 25 years old now. Uh, one of the major difference between the way designers were handling form and the way designers were now should handle form is that they, they insisted that you should treat object as a message. That means one of the responsibility of the object or the shape of the object, the form of the object is to communicate. Uh, now let me uh, sort of uh, tell you how objects speak by doing a small exercise interactively. I will show you a small slide of some object okay and then there will be some questions that I will ask which you have to answer. Its ex exposure is probably one second or something like that. Seen it? Let us answer some of this question. What was the object? Handicam, right? For whom? For us means whom? <laughs> Who are us? Which country would it have come from? Which year? Okay. Yeah, you do not have to be precise around that time, right? Which company could it be? Now tell me how does it speak so much with that one second exposure? And it does say so much, right? I mean I have a, I am just shortening it because it is a one hour class, but uh, there are 10 questions and almost all of them are uh, people are able to kind of uh, answer fairly accurately. I am not saying that it is exactly precise, it is if not Japan, it is Korea and things like that. Okay, but basically in the eastern uh, country. Uh, obviously there has to be something in those form decisions and something in the way you are exposed to the world that seem to connect together to answer these questions, right. So we, you also agreed to the beginning and I have just sort of demonstrated how objects speak, okay. So somehow you know that it is a video camera, it is not a steel camera, it is not a film camera and things like that. So there obviously some kind of a camera ness in that right. Now what is that camera ness and how to capture it. Uh, there is also some kind of a portableness no? because people said it is a handy cam and things like that. So obviously there is something that tells you that it is to be held in hand though there was no clue there was no hand shown at all there is no scale also given. But you do sort of guess that it is something to do with holding in the hand. It also tells you that it is an amateur product because you said it is for us. You know, nobody said that it is for professionals who shoot videography. So there is some kind of an amateurness, a portableness. Uh, so our message that the product gives can be converted into two things. One is what is the object category that is whether it is a camera or a mixer or a microphone or whatever it is. And second thing is a lot of abstract notions which are associated with it. Maybe we can just model this that any object can tell you what that particular object is video camera or uh, you know it could be anything a microphone or whatever it is. It also tells you whether it is for amateurs, professionals or what kind of people housewives or uh, girls or boys it tells a lot of things. It tells whether it is portable, heavy whatever it is. It also tells us that it has something to do with things Japanese things, Indian things, American or something like that right. It also tells us that it may be probably Sony, it may be probably one of those companies in Japan. So there is all this information that we seem to it also tells you that its style of object which is common in 19 whatever 90s of uh, 2000 or 2500 or something. Uh, it also uh, connected with ritual myth, uh, rituals and myths but we do not I mean for instance there is a myth associated with we believe that Sony products will last that is a myth right. So we think it is a dependable product just looking at the form. Uh, now it does not mean that all Sony products bad experiences of Sony products also but we believe in such myths. Uh, it also tells us that it is Japanese, tells us that it is early 90s and the 2000 or whatever it is and it also tells us that belongs to Sony. Uh, okay. 
it is something that happens automatically to all of us okay. Tell me a film from say 1980s, how do you know that uh, uh, we, we seem to always have structured things. No? Uh, I mean there is there thing called golden oldies, you know what does that mean? We know that these are songs from 60s, 50s, 60s and maybe early 70s but not beyond that. Then it is not golden oldies anymore. So we seem to have also some timeline associated with what we see yeah. And you can see this happening our concept of hero or heroine has changed if you look at 1970 we call them as lollipops now right. Then 70s are different, 80s are different, 90s are different and now again they are becoming lollipops you know with hair little more right. So you could see that we seem to perceive association of form with time, we seem to perceive association of form with countries, we seem to uh, perceive association of form with certain category of product or certain characteristic or attributes of product. Now this seems very simple and we seem to do it effortlessly but it is not simple which is what I will prove. We also kind of uh, are able to tell which products are more expensive than others. Yeah. What is in this product that tells us that these cigarettes are likely to be more expensive than maybe others that you buy, yeah. the gold yeah. Uh, but sometimes we also miscommunicate and I will show you so many examples of how miscommunication occurs. I have shown this slide to many people saying asking them where do you press to open, okay. The answer is a lot of people say here. Unfortunately the way the designer has done it is exactly the opposite of that, that is the nozzle, nozzle that comes in. So many times if you are not conscious of product as a message you can make very, very, very uh, sort of uh, I would not say very serious error but you make errors which uh, miscommunicate. So we do deal with uh, uh, concept of primary belongingness that is whether it is a camera or and we think that it is very trivial right? what is there you know everybody knows it is a microphone. Everybody knows this is a laptop, okay. It looks very trivial. Is it trivial? If that was so, machines should be able to recognize objects. Why is it that it is so difficult for machines to recognize objects? Just imagine a cat, right. A child, maybe 2 years or 3 years, is able to recognize cats seeing from any position, incomplete, in dark, right. But machines, find it very difficult if cat sits in a particular position where maybe the third and the fourth legs are not seen. Now why does that happen? No, no, it is just a photograph then what happens? No, you remove the context. Okay, experiences, okay. Uh, it is not trivial in fact human beings have developed some fantastic strategies that we are not even aware of you know we just use them strategy we, we kind of learn these strategies in the process of growing up and these are the strategies that help us to kind of uh, convert that task into things that look very trivial they are not very trivial at all okay. Uh, and this is uh, what is called as human categorization capabilities okay and it is a lot to do with the properties of message so we will come to that. Now I plan to show you 3 slides for a brief exposure, you have to guess what this object is. That brief exposure is very, very brief, it is actually 0.5 seconds. So please concentrate on this, it is possible to recognize it, right. So all I am saying is please concentrate, right. Do not have to tell me what it is, just write down or keep it in mind. Next one, ready? Third one, all right, what were these objects? Line. Second, Owl. third, butterfly. Right? They were actually 0.3 seconds exposure, and we're still able to recognize them. Yeah. Why is it that we are able to do it so efficiently? One of the argument is that you uh, you guys have always seen this before. Yeah. But anyway, I'll show you some things which you have not seen, and even then there will be a problem. Okay. Now. The reason why we are able to see this so quickly and able to categorize in spite of the fact that none of the objects were complete. You could see that actually the all was a twisted one, it was upside down photograph. Even then you are able to recognize, yeah. So obviously there is something powerful with human beings that is important for us to know. Though we had a very big, that means we did not have enough time to look at that picture, you know. 
in spite of that we are able to do it. So what are the cognitive processes involved in this and one of the thing that we do is that we start with there are some visual clues in this which are sufficient for us to tell. The fact that we are able to recognize a lion from just the very small part of his in fact eyes were also not seen what we saw was just the mouth and the uh, moustache and that was enough for and the skin color enough for you to so obviously these are powerful clues which would also mean that we do not seem to need the entire information some important information is good enough for us to recognize a product okay or make a reasonable guess out of it which actually triggers some kind of a search in the brain and it leads to identification of a category. Now all that we are doing is that there are some information rich clues that we seem to select and then identify a category. Now product semantics is exactly the reverse of this. If you understand how people categorize what kind of clues are important for them then you design a product accordingly. So we just reverse that particular process. Why is identification of category so important for human beings? First thing is that it depends how your survival in the I am talking about early days your survival depended on it right. You had to find out whether it is a prey or a threat. If it is a prey you go and pounce on him, if it is a threat you run away yeah and this was important for survival okay fine but that is that issue is not there anymore unless you are on a Bombay road yeah. Now from survival it has gone to our choices and preferences. We completely our choices and preferences are completely dictated by simple visual clues and I want to prove this to you through a small experiment. I in fact we form our mental concept based on these clues so let us look at uh, okay this is a slide which all of you are familiar with those who are from Bombay were more familiar than others but based on this you would be almost able to guess what would be the price of idli there what will be it? Huh? Okay. what kind of a crockery do you expect yeah. which will also make a lot of noise right stainless thing <laughs> okay what kind of waiter do you expect not uniform has a dirty cloth here and a pencil here right okay and then what kind of a cashier do you expect okay and what is behind it calendar a god with that thing shine coming up and down right and uh, also you know there would be that a lot of electric switches like this yeah now just this information is sufficient for us to decide our response shall I go in or not <laughs> correct. This is what is important now survival is not an issue anymore but your entire response is based on some simple clues. What is the price of the idli here okay and what kind of crockery a little more that oblong thing and all that right. And maybe the waiter may have a little better dress or something like that. He is not likely to shout from there. Uh, what kind of a price now? A little more expensive, right? Maybe 15 rupees, 20 rupees, or something like that. You are also likely to get beer here. Yeah, chances of getting a beer are higher, right? So there are so many things that are based on what you see and some very small aspects of what you see that is the point that I am making which are sufficient for you to make decisions. Now see the importance of form that you have keep this in mind when we design a product form that people are going to make decisions they are going to decide whether they like it or not like it whether they are going to buy it not buy it whom they are going to present all those things matter right. So this is what semantics is about but there are issues when designers come in all right you can make mistakes and that is what is happening with modern products all right I will give you another uh, short exposure picture not short I will just keep it forever just guess what that product is yeah what is your guess hmm? what is this product. Hmm. Any guesses? What is this one? All of them have won awards as good product design. 
this is a fire extinguisher this also is a fire extinguisher and this is music amplifier okay now why does this happen <laughs> obviously somewhere we lose on the fact that product must communicate in our urge to create something new you know this designer somehow they think that they have a license to create something new all the time right so in that license we just forget that there are some responsibilities that come with every license so all that we are doing is if we know what semantic devices are important you can create those visual clues or the other way around so there is a relationship between visual clues and semantic devices so if you are conscious of it and i will show you some tools that we are developing by which you can you know what people kind of consider important and not which uh, will tell you more about product semantics okay this is something which is not trivial that's the point that i am making that children's even now perform better than machines and the reason is that the way we process information is very different than the way the machine process information okay and i'll explain you some of this and my entire idea of semantic uh, product semantics is based on this theory okay this is these are called as categorization theory and there are three major exponents of that one of this is almost everything starts with aristotle all the time okay so he has to be there he's he is the first one to came out with a theory then elnor rush and nothing happened till 19 about 50s or so you know everybody uh, uh, aristotle's theory remain unchallenged till 1950s when wittgenstein and elnor rush later came out with their own theories about how they need to modify way what aristotle said so let look at some of this theory then you will understand okay. aristotle mentioned that categories are like beans and it has to have minimum and sufficient criteria to decide what should go into a bin okay so if it has a certain shape a certain size and it may be a handle then it becomes a cup if the size changes the height changes it will become a mug right so each container is a defined container and you decide whether it falls here or it falls here okay so that categorization theory was based on kind of the idea of bins where a very tight and strong boundary is there there are some rules that define it saying that if you meet that rules you are inside a boundary otherwise you are outside the boundary then you get things of this kind <laughs> even in natural objects for instance ostrich owl ostrich is a bird it cannot fit into a criteria of bird at all it just too big if you look at it like that that thick yeah so what do you do with this or owl you know it's something again doesn't fit into that category even penguin doesn't fit one penguin is a bird but it doesn't fly chicken is a bird but it doesn't fly much yeah uh so roche sort of modified that theory and came out with something quite interesting and just see how how is it that human beings recognize all of them as dogs they're so very different right uh so she said that treating non identical objects as equal is a human trait that we categorize by treating non identical not identical objects as exactly opposite of what aristotle had said and the way we treat non identical what is it, whatever is that is not useful for the response we neglect that okay and only take what is useful for the response and decide that they are equal or not not equal uh so this and she she also said that there are some clues which are sufficient for us to categorize for instance this amount of information for you is good enough for you to know that it's a bird okay yeah? don't have to see rest of it okay because she said that objects have predictability okay if it has this kind of a beak then it's also likely to have this kind of legs and this and also feather okay so there is this kind of a bundle of features which are a uh, bundle of features which are predictable and there is a correlation between them and that's the reason why we are able to recognize object and of course the next is a neglecting of differences uh so even in objects like this this uh, of course this slightly older one but you you are able to recognize that this is a particular animal purely because there is a predictability involved if you have these kind of things then you would also have a furry thing uh, furry surfaces and you know what that object is Wittgenstein who is a philosopher uh, he came out with a theory which is absolutely shocking he challenged aristotle's work 
and he is of a stature who can challenge, challenge Aristotle's work. He also challenged Russell. I mean, he is a Russell student in challenge. Uh, he suggested that categories are not defined by boundaries. Okay, and I'll explain you through several examples of that. That categories are defined by a core member. Okay, and everything that you see is is actually compared with that core member to create a gradient. Right? So there's a well characterized core member, and there is there are also others which we compare. You say it's very similar to a very typical example. Not so similar. Not so similar. So, according to him, boundaries are fuzzy, and they are always shiftable. So it allows newer examples to come in. Okay, and now we go back to that example of uh, heroes of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. We have some kind of a characterization of heroes of the 60s. Would be slightly feminine, very, very, uh, what do you call, uh, fair, somewhat pinkish, right? and with very uh, up collar and those kind of things right now we had that kind of a uh, consider as a typical hero of 1960s or a typical heroine would have different kind of discussion a typical film will have different kind of discussion so we have we always identify something which we consider as typical and compare uh, everything against it right who makes typical films then Is it Subhash Gai, Anurag Kashyap, or Benegal? Everybody agrees with that, right? A typical film must have a formula where there are at least a triangle, right? There are two, one, one person. I think there are two brothers there. They separate at the birth, right? And one of them becomes a good guy, the other bad guy, and there, you know, lots of things happen. And at the end, they meet and they realize they are brothers. And Mark comes in and all that kind of thing. So there are several formulas, maybe five or six or eight formulas which mainstream uses. So we call them as uh, we call them as mainstream. The well characterized score is a mainstream, which is fairly well known for every person in that culture. People don't make mistakes. You may not like it's nothing to do with like or dislike. You may like films only by made by Benegal or you know somebody else, Kumar Sahani or whatever it is. But you know that these are typical films, and these are non-typical. Maybe Arjun Satya will come here. Maybe see Gulzar always makes films here. Yeah. They're not typical, but not very atypical also. Okay. So by design, they have decided to position themselves. And we, though we we are not able to, somebody says, you know, can you give me that gradients? You will not be able to give that gradient so clearly, but you know that that gradient exists. Yeah. So this is where the power of Wittgenstein's idea comes in because tomorrow if a new kind of film comes in, initially we might consider this as something that is challenging the boundary, it is part of the boundary and over a period it kind of comes in and it, if it becomes very popular, it might even replace a mainstream. Okay. That's, that is what has happened. Look at iPod. It came here, right? Over a period, Nokia has something which is equivalent, LG has something which is equivalent, almost everybody has copied it. So, when iPod ships closer to that, it is the responsibility of Apple to create something new, and that is why everybody is waiting for 5. You know, iPad 5 is expected to be different. I do not know how, they are not disclosed it, but they are expected to be different. So if you, if a company wants to be here, they have to keep on creating innovations which ultimately influence the mainstream. So iPod is a very successful example. iPad to a certain extent is also one of them. Everybody else has copied it, so there are little more differences than what has happened in this. So designers have an option to decide whether they want to be close to here, close to here, close to here, depending on what client you have and what your personal convictions are. Okay. Some designers prefer to be here all the time. Some designers prefer to be here. Some designers prefer to be here. And I, I told you through, like filmmakers, we also decide no, where we want to be. Okay, let us look at this theory in a little more. Which is a typical monk? This one? This one? This one? Huh? This one? Okay, it may be somewhere in this region. Somewhere it starts becoming a cup, right? 
it becomes it is not exactly cup but it becomes cupish over a period and you will see that is what is happening. Maybe your idea of typical monk is here this is again not very it is a typical all right but it is always structured around a core if you consider this as a typical then you start comparing everything and this this is becomes a slightly away from typical this becomes even little more away this becomes even little more away. So we create a gradients ourselves we have I mean I, it is not exactly ready yet but it is in the operational form we created a software we where we can understand what a given set of consumers consider as very typical okay and it is a kind of a playful exercise that they do they just drag and drop images to find out what is typical and some interesting information comes from that. For instance you know this was for uh, 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 what is our idea of a good restaurant right Wh what do people perceive as being good restaurant how do they separate it from mess you know and these are uh, it, it looks very simple but people have everybody uses some rules. And some interesting rule came out if there are more than 4 people around the table people consider that as a mess okay and I will show you so many surprises that come out of these things. So people just simply classify them as the very typical, typical, not so typical, atypical and very atypical and then all that it does is after this is over it also gives you all the statistics but it also tells you how people have perceived. For instance this was done for several projects one of them was a earring okay. What is a typical earring? Yeah. We will have some idea about our table. How do you find out what is the? So, we asked 30 people to recognize, and we will also this software permits you to have a male idea of a typical and a female idea of typical. And to our surprise, there was very little difference between a typical earring that ladies identified and typical earring that uh, men identified. It had to have, you know, some kind of a dangling thing, it is some, some semicircle here, and you know, it should sort of move and think like that. I will show you the example. So when we converted this into a map from typical to atypical this is what happened you know very typical had to have a certain description yeah all of them had that uh, jumki or I do not know what it is called that type of thing and everything that was circular was considered as atypical okay. Now this is of course uh, over uh, just a short sample of 30 people. So it just tells you users perception of it. Uh, one of the student decided that uh, let us look at what is a typical stamp okay. and something very very interesting. Typical stamp is still considered as a government stamp must have a leader or some important person must be muddy in color and must have those lines which sort of break that kind of thing right. And then there is a huge gap and you can see all the things that graphic designers do are considered as atypical. Okay, that is the way people perceive. So what we call as a modernistic stamp are not typical stamp at all for people. So we have not been able to change the perceptions of people through all the output that we have created. Now this is true with stamp for a very different reason people do not use stamps that often now with the emails and all that. So in exposure probably your ideas are still kind of frozen here you know they did not succeed they are not succeeded in changing it. So this, these are all considered as non-typical stamp and these are considered as typical stamp. Uh, we did this with lighters okay. and uh, interesting part about it is typical lighter is now considered as the one that is transparent often color blue or green and has that, that cricket came out with that kind of thing for the first time but that is considered typical. But believe me some years ago this was a typical <laughs> lighter yeah. So you could see how shifts occur you know. and that is the reason why we say this is 60s, this is 70s because what was typical in 60s may have shifted to a typical in uh, you know 90s and you could actually the software kind of gives you the entire map of what happens. This allows you to do many other things uh, uh, this software and it also allows you to sort of combine them into creating opportunities like that you know you takes see it builds a very systematic image boards based on the way people perceive and then you can make combinations of it to create your own idea of uh, product uh, products which are consistent with semantics. For instance uh, he selected these images completely randomly. You know this comes from ignition it is a uh, car thing this also comes from uh, torch you know that uh, flame torch and this this is a lighter that is typical this comes from uh, female I mean these are all uh, uh, lipsticks and things like that and he actually created a lighter like this okay which has a lighterness but yet new you know because it incorporates things from this it actually it works like that if you turn it around comes up and the flame comes up and turn it off it goes down yeah. And 
we could actually predictably shift it closer to the mainstream. And this was supposed to be somewhere in the middle, closer to the mainstream by actually copying that transparent green thing on which the uh, fuel is kept. Yeah. All right. So we come back to the categorization. I just told you the use of that, but uh, that there is this kind of a thing that happens that we define something as cup, something as map. We seem to have a definition, but they are fairly loose. If you go by Wittgenstein, the boundaries are fuzzy. It admits newer things to come in. Now, this is significant for designers because if you have a fuzzy boundary, you have an opportunity. Otherwise, where is the opportunity? Opportunity comes from the fact that there is a fuzzy boundary. And the purpose of design is to challenge that boundary to get a new entry. It is not to do mainstream, but to create something new, right. So you challenge that boundary and bring something new in, okay. They are always challenge the boundaries and persuade people to shift them uh, to make sure that they do not lose their, but at the same time when you challenge a boundary, there is a chance that it will actually not be admitted by people as part of the category and it becomes only a novelty. You know, so you take a risk when you are on the boundary that it either gets accepted or it becomes a novelty. And there are a lot of films which have, you know, you could look at films as a good way of, or a lot of songs which are treated as novelty after some time, right, because they do not influence others. So a successful entry into a fuzzy boundary is the one that influences others to copy. So this is a ex actual example, this is a typical cup, this is a typical mug. And a friend of mine created this, which is not a cup nor, nor a mug, yeah. It challenged that boundary to do something in between, okay, and ask people to now classify. Is this a cup or is this a mug? You know? See, it has a proportions of a cup, but a shape of a mug and the handle which is not of the cup or a mug altogether. How do we use category belongingness in the design process? Roche gave one more theory and that is called as object in taxonomy. What she was suggesting is that every product has a, a basic level and a superordinate level. So there is uh, something called all this hacksaw, planesaw, breadsaw, they are all kind of products that exist uh, in the real world. And they create a concept called saw, they create a concept called plane, a concept called hammer and there is also a concept that we develop called woodworking tools. Yeah. And all this is a human invention. It does not exist in reality. For instance, there is no saw in the world. Saw is a human invention. What exists is hacksaw, plane saw, fret saw. No, it cannot be just if uh, the plane saw is normally called as a saw, but that is not correct. If plane saw is a plane saw, hacksaw is a hacksaw. If there is no tree in the world, you know, tree cannot exist in the world. It has to be either a mango tree or a coconut tree or something. A tree is a human invention, you know, so that we can refer to the entire category of things. So it is because we are able to do it that we can process so much of information. Now in a design what we typically do is we look at what is the fret sawness of fret saw, hack sawness of hack saw, sawness of a saw which is anyway defined by this and a woodworking toolness of a woodworking tool. If you can abstract those visual clues then you have a vocabulary which you can use in design so that your design is semantically consistent. Uh, let us look at some of the successful examples. A friend of mine who did this in NID. He was asked, he was designing a mug, he actually used the proportions of a mug, but he has borrowed this from somewhere else. Where do you think he has borrowed this from? Where do the other features come from? This comes from tumblers, military tumblers. You remember that blue line, okay. And this comes from beer features, yeah. Now the point that I am making is so far as you borrow from within this whole taxonomy, you would still be able to create something new, but it will be semantically consistent. People will not find it odd because you know that this belongs to some kind of uh, devices which you use, which are part of that category, right. So it gives you a kind of a handle of how to borrow new things and create innovation. It borrows from tumblers and pictures, that is the way it works, okay. So these are some of the other products which have, uh, th this was an interesting example. Uh, I did a project where, see Diwali Kandil had a tradition of, you know, the way it had a shape. It is completely destroyed now, you know, anything is now which has a lamp inside is considered a Diwali thing. So we thought that is it possible to do something which brings back that tradition and still looks different, okay. 
So this girl came out with an idea, she, she was a textile designer, she came out with these things which are made separately and they are assembled to create the uh, one of the thing about Diwali Kandal is that normally a father sits with children and sort of makes it before Diwali and puts it up. You know? That tradition was there, now people just go out, go to a shop and buy it. Yeah? So to bring back that tradition she actually created this, so it is folded and it lays flat. It is actually made of this and then she created these things which actually give that feeling of that. So it is possible to look at semantics as a device for form innovation. This is uh, done by some other uh, designer abroad. Look at it, you know, electronic musical instrument do not need this, but they are there to tell you what they are. <laughs> they are added so that you have sufficient visual clues to know what that product is rather than just so you know saying that look it is now new technology so it is a new product and you better learn what that is. Uh, you can consciously do it and it is one of the product that I explained yesterday. This actually this is done for people who have extremely low vision and none of them want others to know that they have you know most of the disciples do not want it to be known that they have that particular discernment. So this was where I decided to borrow from categories outside that you know instead of taking taking clues from physical handicap aids we took clues from photography mainly to create a kind of a thing they are saying that look this is some kind of good photographic material. So you actually borrowed to create that communication which gives us a status okay. So this comes from lenses, this comes from shutter and this comes from uh, and there is also another thing that comes from shutter itself and actually we use the camera lens itself to cover that. So you can actually systematically decide to borrow depending on what you want to communicate. So these were all borrowed with that idea. This is one of the toughest projects that I had. Uh, BRC had developed uh, a radiographic camera, okay, which was huge, about 30 kg, and uh, you know it had to be taken to sites to check welding and things like that. Now, how do you make it look like a camera? You know, it's a very different kind of uh, thing, you know. And they had created a big box. It's almost like. Uh, some of the bags that we carry, you know, but two people have to carry of course 30 kgs are fairly because inside there is that uh, depleted uranium which is quite heavy. Okay. So we actually borrowed from camera to create a number of features. This comes from uh, stu studio cameras, this actually comes from lenses, this also is a lens cap that comes in. Actually by borrowing you could at least create the feeling that it is a camera you know, and not a bag which contains instruments. In fact it, it, it to the extent these are the sizes. Huh? To the extent that even it, it had to be operated remotely, so we use that uh, uh, remote operations of camera as a device to operate this particular. Uh, so it is possible to borrow features from outside the category to create innovation, which is what a lot of people do. You know, for instance, charms borrowed from jeans, you know, that cigarette, purely to show whom this is for, okay. or this borrows from jewelry, right? You know, all the gold that comes in just to show that I am expensive. So metaphoric links with other objects not part of the taxonomy can create its own communication. Okay. Some examples of my own work, uh, we were developing a telephone several years ago uh, and I had this idea that uh, people have you know we believe that sound goes in waves yeah. and I thought that if you behind the, the, the microphone if you have these waves which go people will consider that something to do with communication. Okay. So we created several shapes of receivers with this waves kind of shape and this is the final product that came out that those waves sort of from receiver go on to this main body and there are several metaphors built to this. One of these metaphors is a wave, the other, other thing was that this is th this was something which you open and inside this there your directory. You know. So that uh, message book and directory kind of a thing also comes out of this. Uh, we tested this metaphor and most of the people were able to find out what this comes from okay. And with the third metaphor was the diary, so all of the all these were considered as sort of entries in the diary that is because I wanted it to look like an office phone. Now how do you communicate the idea of an office phone being different than a residential phone? But there are difficulties, <laughs> if you decide to borrow you also have certain responsibilities. For instance during 60s and 50s cars borrow a lot from the aircraft. Yeah, these were actually uh, features that came from aircraft. This also fins that came from uh, uh, speed boats and aircrafts and all. And they were heavily criticized because these were considered as unsafe. 
Okay. In fact, uh, the entire styling collapsed because of the book by Ralph Nader on unsafe at any speed because so many accidents took place where these uh, things poked into people that they had to kind of uh, give up that idea. So when you use a metaphor you also have a responsibility you cannot just for the sake of communication you cannot create unsafe products. So there has to be a caution there. So what makes objects look amateur, portable or sporty or uh, whatever you know. Uh, so that software of course permits you to do that but let me give, uh, give you an example of that quickly. Uh, you can crop an image and ask people to guess what kind of object that it belongs to okay and that is how we could actually define sports thingness the whole idea of what, what is the word sports thingness means to people and believe me it will mean different in different countries you know depending on what sports are popular okay. If you go to European countries it is football that will dictate yeah. In India it will be cricket that will dictate and some other countries some other games will dictate. So the concept of sports thing is, was abstracted from some of these images that came in and then this was a one day exercise where they were supposed to design a small t-shirt out of paper which actually uses some of those features to create that sports thing. But besides this being one day it can be a very serious exercise for instance Nike created a wristwatch which has enormous amount of sports in it and also Nike-ness in it. Okay. Look at what they do, look at the way these straps were designed, this actually comes from shoes no? those, those things. So they actually borrowed from their own things to say that we are a sport, we are presenting a sports watch and that sports watch comes from Nike. Okay. So this is just a complimentary thing that say they also have a symbol but the way it was done it was sufficient for people to know that it is a sports uh, wristwatch and it comes from a particular house. So in this exercise what we were doing is we were asking people to look at uh, for instance this was machineness you know. So uh, the whole idea of notion of what is machineness and we asked people to sort of uh, uh, rate this and created this particular scale and actually created a product and it is a, uh, it's a jacket which creates that machineness in it. Uh, it is actually a crumpled paper <laughs> and uh, uh, nuts which are uh, stuck to it. Okay, then there is something called uh, the children, it was for a children product. So it, it needed to look at what uh, children products are associated with playfulness and this was a kind of a rain, uh, rain gear that was designed. So abstract concepts are contextual to the project and it depends on what is it that you want to communicate and once you decide that I want uh, this product has to be playful, I must actually define the word playfulness through images. And that software permits you to do that you know how people perceive playfulness, how people consider perceive sport thingness, how people consider even churchness can be sort of looked at you know, what is a churchness for people. In fact churchness it is interesting most of the ideas of church are actually frozen into gothic churches. A lot of modern buildings are not considered a church at all. You know. So you had to build special devices to explain the churchness of a church when you build a modern church. So objects have layers of meaning, the first layer is of course what category it belongs whether it is a laptop, whether it is a mobile phone or whether it is a, a microphone or whatever it is okay. that is the first level and it also has several other levels you know it is for whom it is made, why, uh, uh, what country it belongs to all those things that we did in the beginning th th these are the layers that you need to build right. So it is always category belongness to some kind of abstract notions that you want to build and these layers need to be ticked uh, tackled independently by creating image words which is what I showed you through that software and uh, layers are to be derived from function user segments they also derived from careful study of user and his or her psychological profile you know, what kind of a persona we are dealing with and what are their perceptions. So taking care of people's perception in design of a form is what semantics is all about. Okay, so problem of man-made objects which do not have upper limit on these layers. You can go on building layers more and more layers and you would find that somewhere it breaks down and that is where we, uh, what one calls as over designing things so because you can always add newer messages and this is what then happens. So there is still a Tight drop, uh, tight drop walk that designers are do. It's quite likely that you might simply over-design things. Yeah. 
So you need to balance this all the time. So do treat objects as messages which is what is happening since 1984.